Thanks, Martin, for the nice introduction, and thanks to the organizer for inviting me here. Um, when they, they invited me, they, they asked me to do a bit of a, a link between the two parts of the, of the conference, so you had a lot of uh, X-ray imaging, so let's say high energy stuff, and then we are, we'll have a few talks on lower energy stuff, so they asked me to do a bit uh, in between in half an hour, that's easy task. And that is made even more complicated by the fact that the last three minutes from Bij you were very close to a lot of things I had to say. So, so I will expand on uh, your nice uh, presentation, on the end of your nice presentation. Um, so the just, uh, I have one marketing slide, because Wega Pixel is not very well known, it's very new. Um, we want to provide turnkey solution for advanced custom CMOS image sensors, and it, was created only a few months ago, and uh, it comes from uh, experience uh, we had in the past from medical imaging. So this is uh, the sensor which is now commercialized from uh, by Vivamos uh, electron microscopy. Where um, this is a sensor which is now commercialized by FEI, and of course high and ultra high speed imaging. Uh, Vega Pixel is uh, part of specialized imaging which won a. A Queen's Award uh, for Enterprise for Innovation uh, this year for the sensor uh, I designed previously. So that's the 5 million frames per second that uh, Martin mentioned before. So I, I had to select some topics. Of course, in half an hour, you can't talk about all CMOS uh, word. So I, I chose a few topics which are at the heart of the uh, well, a lot of X-ray imaging, as we heard before. So I will talk briefly about yield, uh, radiation hardness, then about radiation hardness, dynamic range, uh, speed, and then coming to the conclusions. And before the conclusion, I will have a few videos just to light up the, uh, the, the talk. So first of all, you're just going very basically. So Moore's law, uh, you, why CMOS is so powerful because it has been um, we have more and more transistors. It has been going on for uh, decades. Um, and we have now transistors which are very small, approaching physical limit. And actually, that's a slide from um, so the, the industry um, meets every couple of years to, to look at what they can do. And last roadmap of the industry actually said we can make transistors physically smaller. So if we want to continue, let's say, scaling and putting more transistors in a in a, in, a, in a piece of silicon, then we have to go 3D. And then, so we have the end of 2D scaling and the beginning of 3D scaling, uh, but we still, you will be, so even the transistor are a few nanometers, you will be hearing about nodes which are 1.5 nanometers or something like this. So how the uh, Moore's law uh, benefited uh, the industry is in uh, providing the, the, basically the, uh, the, the base for pixel scaling. And uh, that's uh, um, a graph which is adapted from, uh, it was something which was first, the first noticed by Eric Fossum uh, almost 20 years ago now, uh, that the minimum size of the pixel you can make is uh, basically between 10 and 20 times the smallest transistor you can make. So uh, nowadays, um, well, we, you can do even smaller than, we could do even smaller one micron, but effectively people realize that about one micron is, uh, well, there's not, not many image sensors go beyond one micron, and for example, mobile phone image sensors are now getting a bit higher up in pitch, in some cases. So that's we come, where we come from. Um, so a lot of, uh, yeah, you can do very small pixels. And iPhone 7 is, uh, yeah, um, 1.12 uh, micron pixel, 1.2 micron pixel. And uh, but for X-ray imaging, for example, we have very large pixels. So you can put uh, something like 1680, uh, 1680 pixels in one 50 micron, which is uh, 50 micron in X-ray imaging world is a small pixel. Yeah. So, and how many pixels do you need to make an iPhone sensor? Only 7,000. So. So it's really a totally different word. And um, so when we start talking about yield, or what to do with the pixels, then it's, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a kind of problem for designers. Well, there's a lot to do. We can do a lot, but uh, 
what to do exactly. And uh, um, yeah, designers have a, uh, well, everybody has got a lot of vacui, so we don't like uh, uh, empty spaces, so we want to do something. So we'll try to do something with this. Um, the other considerations is that uh, large pixels, so making large pixels is not just uh, only putting things in the pixel. There are also <coughs> other considerations. One has to, there are different trade-offs for uh, noise and charge collection in the pixel. So there are some um, careful design, which is a bit different from a small pixel, where the, the light is collected immediately. So it's one micron, uh, diff diffuse your drift there, and it's collected in a large pixel. If you do a, a very small diode, well, the light, uh, uh, not the light, but the charge has to travel a lot of in the silicon, so there could be other effects related to this. And uh, complex pixel, of course, in CMOS is um, not complicated. Even you can do it uh, in uh, active pixel sense, so there are other complications. Maybe I don't, I don't want to enter into this, uh, but it is possible to do complicated electronics with high uh, quantum efficiency in CMOS, and uh, that's one of the design uh, I did in my past uh, work at uh, Rutherford Laboratory. Uh, so that, that's a pixel which is very much like a hybrid pixel for those of you who know. And it has about 600 transistors in uh, 70 micron pitch. Just uh, one word about stitching, uh, probably all of you know about stitching, but uh, stitching is, uh, so you have a, a reticle and it's a different design style, so the, the full sensor is not, doesn't fit in the reticle, so you have to do modules on the reticle, and then uh, you build the sensor from, uh, from uh, modules. And in this way we can get uh, a very large, uh, up to a wafer scale sensor, so the limit is just the size of the wafer. So I want to say, try to say a few words about yield for wafer scale sense. So because it's uh, probably it's a different uh, word uh, again from the uh, say the main market for image sense, which is fairly small. Um, if you have a, a normal, so this is uh, represents an eight inch well, uh, a silicon wafer, CMOS wafer. Um, normally you have a lot of dyes, and if you have one defect, is one dye that dies, so that's not a big uh, problem. Uh, it's only 99%, well, still 99% yield, something like this. Um, but if you have a, a wafer scale sensor, that can be uh, a big problem. It, it, it potentially can kill the sensor. This said, there are also some advantage in doing a wafer, uh, an image in general, it has got some redundancy uh, built in, in the sense you, if you lose a pixel, it's not the end of the world, normally. Um, and then you can build redundancy in the electronics as well. But, all of this to say that it's a different word, and effectively models which are which were um, uh, developed for industry for calculating yield of dyes they don't work for uh, large dyes, and this actually, as far as I know, is a good thing because uh, the yield predicted by this model is zero, so that's not the case. So uh, it's a good thing. So just trying to say something more about how to design a. a or what, what the impact of defects can be on a, on a wafer scale sensor. So uh, that's a typical floor plan for a three-side battable sensor, so that already something a bit unusual with respect to normal images where you have all the four sides, you can put electronics drivers, but in a three-side battable, uh, you only have one side, and the other actually, you have to be careful also how you dice uh, for when, uh, when you go to the edge of the wafer. But, so in a three-side battable sensor, you see, um, um, yeah, most of the area is normally it's most of the area which is taken by the, the pixel array, and there is already probably some addressing logic. So it's not just pixels; there will be some driving electronics in the pixel array um, to do part of the uh, what would be the, the row addressing. If you think the row in my picture uh, vertical. And then on the, on the side where we can uh, where we have freedom, then we have the normal um, amplifier column amplifiers, analog to digital converter, uh, row address, and then other blocks, uh, whatever we want to do in, in, with the CMOS itself. So there are two very distinct areas in the, in the floor plan. So there's a pixel array, which is a, a huge area, which tends to be fairly empty, 
but it is huge and you have very long lines to connect uh, the pixels. And when I say very long lines, it's centimeters, 10 or centimeter, 12 centimeters or even more. And then we have a, a different area which tend to be much smaller but also much denser because you have all the electronics is there. So you have to, you have to pack it somewhere. So if you look at uh, defect types, when we analyze a defect and when we design a sensor, we have to look at uh, uh, different defect types. And I, I try to do a, a very rough classification. So as I said before, uh, there are two areas, the pixel array and the periphery. And then uh, we can look at what I, well, I try to distinguish between localized defects, so when, where you have just a device failure or uh, pixel internal routing failure, for example, and then global defects where you have long lines which are broken and uh, you have shorts and opens. And then in the, in the four boxes there, you have the, the effects of what they can do. Um, so if you have a localized defect in a pixel, uh, there's not, uh, it, it can be very easy. To, I mean, just uh, it brings to the pixel failure, so it's not uh, catastrophic for the sensor. And if you, you want to avoid that the pixel, maybe you get shorts between power supplies uh, and ground, and then um, there is where the design has to help in, in avoiding these catastrophic failures. And then in the, in the well, if, you, if you go down, of course, if you have, uh, let's say, shorts, then you can lose uh, columns or, or rows, so lines in general. And then sometimes you can also lose uh, stitching blocks. And that can be a, a, a problem. In the periphery, if you have localized defects, um, in that case, because there are some uh, lines driving for control of the, of the sensor, you can lose you can end up losing um, lines or while losing the sensor eventually and or having loss of functionality and similar. And for global defects, again, uh, you can lose lines and stitching blocks. So just closing this session about the uh, yield, um, I try to summarize in a very succinct way, but uh, uh, take on messages that large pixels or large sensor demanded a very different design style. And uh, one question, which is uh, kind of a piggyback on what uh, Biju was saying before, is uh, uh, one thing you want to do is to harness the complexity and have, uh, so put complexity in large pixels. So the second part, second section was, uh, if you remember, on radiation hardness. So I have just a very brief reminder of what the effects of radiation um, damage are on, uh, on a CMOS sensor. And, <clears throat> and then uh, come to the conclusion, say where, where we are in terms of uh, how, how much radiation hardness can be achieved with state-of-art uh, components. So the, I, I want to distinguish uh, between the what I call the CMOS is the, the electronics reading out uh, uh, well, all the transistors effectively, um, and ADCs, other blocks, uh, other functional blocks one can have in a sensor, and then the, the sensor itself, and, and both uh, would have two different types of uh, um, damage. One which is called total ionizing dose, so a particle coming through generates electron hole pairs, and then we will talk later what, what they do. And the other one is uh, what is called non-ionizing energy loss. So the, uh, you get, uh, so <laughs> particles are not uh, generating, a, what? particles are hitting atoms and moving them out of the lattice, so creating real defects in the silicon. So basically breaking the, 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 the crystalline structure of the, of the material. And uh, on the side of these ones, there are also single event effects. So one particle causing, a, uh, for example, a memory to flip or uh, big current to flow in the circuit when you have a latch up. Um, I, I, don't, I won't say much about those, so, but I just want you to mention for completeness. 
So first part, so now let's look at the damage for, for CMOS. Uh, so if you have a, a photon, X-ray photon or, or a particle coming through, or well, any, any ionizing radiation effectively generates electron hole pair in silicon, then they would be uh, separated. And here you see the structure which is shown here is the, the gate, basically polysilicon gate, silicon dioxide and silicon. And um, at the end, you basically left with positive charge, which is trapped normally close to the interface. And so you have a, uh, uh, you start with a, with the oxide or the transistor, which was uh, neutral, and then at the end you have something which is uh, uh, positive, and that causes um, the transistor to change uh, behavior. And this is uh, kind of summarized, well, maybe that very technical slide, but uh, so that's summarized by a quantity, which is the, the voltage, uh, fresher voltage shift, which increases with the radiation. There is uh, one good thing about uh, going smaller in CMOS, something which was realized uh, already basically over 30 years ago, which, so this slide, this picture is from a paper in, from 1980. So this is represents how much damage basically we have as a function of the, of the size of the transistor, simplifying. And you can see that as you make transistors smaller, the damage goes uh, down good thing, and even it goes down even more quickly when you go to very small transistors. So using very small technology is a good thing and kind of cure the radiation hardness, at least for, so be, I say the small feature size uh, technology become kind of inherently radiation hard. Up to a point in the sense that uh, transistors are complicated structure and they have a, so as I said before, there is a part of the, of the oxide there, but uh, also we have to connect the transistors and then when they connect, you go immediately on very thick, you know, very, it's like having a big transistor, the equivalent of having a big transistor next to a small one. So you have to take care of these small, big transistors and then people do uh, funny things like uh, uh, round layouts, and uh, in this way you can really take care of the, of the radiation hardness of, uh, of transistors. So, so there are ways, both through technology and through um, design, to, um, to get very rad hard uh, sensors. And um, I mean, in the past I worked a lot in particle physics, which probably delivers the worst type of environment uh, available on Earth and uh, any space a lot. Um, and they are really, people can make detectors or can make readout electronics uh, in CMOS for these type of environments. Um, there is, if you remember in my four boxes, there was one box for uh, non-ionizing non damage. I won't say anything non-ionizing non damage for uh, CMOS because effectively there is, it's found to be uh, immune, basically. So there's no need to look into these things. And so if you go to the sensor part, um, again, for ionizing those, there are some effects, maybe without going too much into the details, but basically uh, they can be cured, or these rounds should have been there, it moved, but. Uh, uh, you can uh, kind of see this, uh, this is a diode um, design, in a red hard design, and it has similar shape of the, of the transistors I showed you before, and that can cure uh, the uh, radiation hardness of the, of the sensor. So that's for the ionizing dose. For the non-ionizing dose, <coughs> Um, so as I said before, this, uh, so non-ionizing dose is uh, a particle arriving, photon or a particle, and hitting a, an atom and displacing it and creating basically a, a damage to the crystalline lattice. So it's really a, a breaking the silicon or any other material. Um, and I want to, bore, let's say, be a bit uh, technical on this one. So the, uh, this is a plot showing uh, again, it's uh, non-ionizing damage as a fa function of the, uh, of the energy, basically, of the particles. And you can see there protons, so 
for example, well, Phil is not here um, today, but uh, we had a talk yesterday about uh, proton therapy. So, uh, so for when designing a, a sensor for proton therapy, one has to take care of this because protons do do damage to the crystalline lattice. So one has to do uh, uh, think about this. Um, Electrons do the same. Uh, good news about uh, photons for X-ray imaging is that uh, there is a threshold at 250 kV, so, so most applications don't need to worry uh, about uh, um, lattice damage caused by the X-rays. It's only if you go to uh, a radiotherapy application then you have uh, these type of photons. But so, so we have the, to take care of this type of damage, and what, what do we want to do? Um, so what happens to the silicon and how we, can we uh, basically cure, uh, somehow um, manage this damage? One thing, important thing is that uh, when the silicon gets damaged, um, the electron hole carriers, they get trapped more quickly. And with increasing damage, they get trapped more and more quickly. So the solution is to try to get them to the right place before they get trapped, basically. And this means for the, um, for the silicon device means um, collecting, the well, collecting the charge very quickly and the, the way to do it is putting electric field, which is not commonly there in an image sense or not everywhere at least. So the, say the, the solution to, to this problem is to use uh, fully depleted CMOS um, Normally, CMOS sensors are not fully depleted. They, they have a very big area which is not um, uh, depleted. And there are, in this field, there are different solutions which are starting to come alive. And uh, um, one of them is, uh, which comes again from the particle physics communities to use a high voltage process for, for the CMOS part. So summarizing this uh, rather technical part, uh, take-home message is, uh, uh, so the, I summarized my take-home message in this table, which is, shows a kind of limit, uh, um, try to get the highest number possible, where, where we can go with uh, either bits. So for TID in both CMOS and the sensor, we can probably get to uh, one 10 mega gray. So 10 mega gray is one gigawatt. There are some recent data about this. Um, for the NEIL part, CMOS is, um, as I said, is very high. Uh, I couldn't really find the number. But for the sensor part, um, people are working for in particular physics, for example, towards getting uh, well, the, the number to 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15 neutron equivalent, which is a very high number. So just to give a, an idea, space is more like 10 to the 11 most the applications, so, so there we're talking three orders of magnitude more. Um, I have to say this number should be taken with a, a pinch of salt in the sense that uh, definition of what is acceptable in a sensor used in a radiation uh, hard environment depends on, on the application and uh, people might adjust the specs so that the sensor can live longer or in some application is not uh, needed really. So third part, oh, how many minutes? For, probably I should, uh, how many minutes, Martin, do you know? Yeah, five, minutes. five minutes, that's what I thought, yeah. So I will be very quick on this part. Uh, um, that's a three minute syndrome. So high dynamic range, uh, there are different solutions. Also Biju mentioned some of them. Uh, the one I probably like most is, well, there's dual gain pixels, but also lateral overflow. Uh, can deliver uh, linear pixels uh, which have a very high dynamic range. Uh, and uh, this is an example, again, taken from one of my last projects I was working on in my previous life. So that's a Percival project. Um, and there we achieved a, a dynamic range of 20 bits on a 25 micron pitch. Uh, the advantage of the lateral overflow is that you don't need to have any uh, pre-knowledge of the image you want to acquire, like what you need for dual gain, for example. Uh, and of course, photon counting is uh, uh, 
for example, a way of extending dynamic range even further and maybe providing even more things like color imaging. Ideally, photon counting gives you uh, no noise. Um, and these are different solutions uh, found in literature, but what I want to show is that this is a, a 55 micron pixel in uh, one of the latest uh, Medipix uh, uh, chip by CERN. And you can see there's a lot of electronics in the, to do this photon counting. There are some other solutions which uh, people are trying to um, make live. Uh, so do photon count with uh, much lower count, uh, transistor count. Still more than three, but uh, lower count. And one thing I want to mention also is that noise in CMOS image sensor is becoming very good. And uh, this is a slide, uh, this is a slide from a Kavaito paper and one recent paper from Eric Fossum, and you can see the noise going down, and now we are sub electron noise. So we start doing photon counting with uh, conventional image sensors, and that's maybe uh, something to bear in mind. The performance in CMOS sensors have changed, so maybe there are also some changes which can be done in, uh, in uh, sensor for X ray uh, imaging. That was my take home message. And last point was speed before going to the conclusion. And I will skip uh, through the technical bits and just show a couple of plots. So this is, um, um, shows speed of pixels um, or CMOS sensor as a function of the year. And the speed is uh, labeled in, uh, with a pixel rate. So bear in mind the gigapixel. So this is the line, for example, for a gigapixel per second which means you can read a million uh, megapixel sensor at 1,000 frames per second. So that's high speed. And nowadays, faster sensor, which are, by the way, megapixel sensor, they go at about 20,000 frames per second. But they are smaller sensor than a, a wafer scale. They're not wafer scale. They're relatively uh, large, but not wafer scale or not stitched at all. So if we go to wafer scale, the frame rate becomes a bit smaller. And this is uh, a slide with axis just for sake of confusion, uh, different from the previous one. Uh, so that's a megapixel in one direction and frames per second in this one. So the, uh, now, you know, in the plot before, I had gigapixel rate, constant gigapixel rate was horizontal. Now it's uh, this uh, 45 degree line. And uh, these are, um, most, if not all, of the uh, wafer scale sensor in the in the field, and you can see where they stand, and uh, they are slower than the other ones. And these are the sensor which is uh, uh, commercialized by Viva Moss, and we, which I designed when I was in RAL, which is one of the fastest in the field, providing 30 frames per second at almost seven megapixel resolution. And so the take home message is that, yeah, the pixel rate for X-ray images is increasing and uh, we have the potential to go even further when we look at smaller chips and what can we do with this? So that's a um, question for the, for the users. And the very last uh, section, I got one minute maybe? Yeah. Or they gone, yeah, or they gone. gone behind, below, uh, okay, but just, these are just videos so we can uh, think about uh, questions uh, already. And this is, um, so the panel I was showing before, this is a two side battable panel with 50 micron pitch and that's a movie from the very first example. So um, what I showed there is the optical equivalent taken at normal speed. So you can see um, the, the X-ray is taking pictures at video rate. And uh, just to show, uh, that's another part of a medical, um, just going towards the next uh, talk somehow, um, different sensors, that's a high speed, the very high speed sensor um, I designed, so this goes two million frames per second and it's used to study um, uh, particles for dental etching. And, um, this is another interesting application which is uh, more related to the cancer care topic, 
we have in this workshop. Um, so this video was taken at five million frames per second and it shows micro bubbles uh, bursting and spilling out uh, uh, drugs. This is uh, in a test, but the idea is that then you can use this to um, uh, provide localized um, injection of drugs for, to cancer cells. And then coming to the conclusion, so the, yeah, I think it's a bit what also Biju was saying. So CMOS technology can offer improved performance. And so far, what we've seen in the X-ray medical field is probably mainly a kind of replacement of, uh, of existing panels. But CMOS can offer much more. So it'd be good to see if we can do something with that. And there have been, uh, in, recent <clears throat> in recent years, improvements in dynamic range, radiation hardness, and, and speed. And uh, we want to look into harnessing complexity and putting more complexity in pixels while making a, a viable product for the field. That concludes my talk, so thank you for your attention. <laughs>